Recently, I got a very overexcited email from Green NCAP, the sustainability offshoot of the European New Car Assessment Programme body, Euro NCAP. Euro NCAP, as I'm sure you're familiar with, fulfills a similar role to the National Highways Traffic Safety Administration, or NHTSA as it's colloquially known in the US. It's well known for driving cars into blocks of concrete and other cars at a variety of speeds and providing an excellent analysis of how safe those vehicles are. And so, the decision of the sustainability arm of the group to complete life cycle analysis of cars would, one hoped, quash that ridiculous notion that EVs aren't much cleaner than gas cars that perpetually circulates in some areas. I hoped it might provide some more clarity about just how much cleaner and greener EVs are. Only, like so many dreams, it didn't quite work out that way. Green NCAP has done some interesting things in its calculations, so dig out your Sinclair Scientific and let's go look at them, shall we? But first, in my imagination, there is no complication. I dream about you clicking that notification bell. In my mind, a celebration, the sweetest of sensation, of you hitting subscribe and checking your notification settings. Transport Evolved's proprietary blend of fresh as a daisy news, reviews and context is supported by viewers like you and by me, Mauling Song Lyrics. So if you'd like me to stop or continue, hang out till the end of the video when I'll tell you how you can support the channel. Oh, and if you're a Patreon supporter, first up, thank you. But can I ask you to take a quick moment to check your details at Patreon because Apparently a chunk of our supporters' cards have expired and not been updated. Thanks. The green NCAP assessment has been completed for about 60 cars at the time of writing, and intends to identify vehicles which maximise, quote, the reduction of its own pollutants and greenhouse gases, and at the same time operates at minimised fossil fuel consumption and or maximised energy efficiency under real world conditions, end quote. It's made of several components, but the most significant components are the life cycle analysis, which you'll be familiar with if you've seen any of our previous videos on the comparative emissions for fossil fuel vehicles. We'll drop some links down in the description below. And a new measure called the primary energy demand, or PED, which we'll come back to later. It joins Life Cycle Analysis, or LCA, in the list of exciting new acronyms you're going to be learning in today's video. It should be noted, incidentally, that Green NCAP's LCA does come with a significant caveat, and that is that, quote, with regard to the impact on global warming and total primary energy demand, the most relevant environmental aspects are accounted for. However, other environmental effects like emissions of NOx, sulphur dioxide, particulate matter, and their consequential impacts like acidification, ozone formation, and toxicity to humans are not considered." End quote. But today I'm not diving into the rest of that because we have bigger fish to fry. Green NCAP concludes that compact and mid-sized BEVs show slightly lower life cycle greenhouse gas emissions than fossil fuel cars in the context of the European average energy mix. Big and powerful BEVs may be in the same range as diesels or petrol vehicles. This is a highly suspect statement in the context of other studies out at the same time, and I'm going to drop in a huge hat tip here to Orca Hoekstra, who does a awesome job of catching this kind of nonsense and instantly flagged this, along with an excellent breakdown of where the numbers came from. You should read some of them. We've dropped some links below. So the first bit of dubiosity in the green NCAP LCA is the amount of carbon dioxide created in the battery manufacturing process. Here it's chosen to use a value of 112 kilos of CO2e per kilowatt hour. Now, more recent studies have suggested a much lower value, sometimes as low as 50 kilos of carbon dioxide equivalent per kilowatt hour, and even using usable battery capacity for the Volvo study from last year and not the actual larger battery capacity, that yields a result of under 90 kilos of carbon dioxide equivalent. So we're starting off by tacking on at least 20% of bonus extra emissions to the EV that don't exist. Strong start there. 
Next, for some reason that's not entirely apparent, Green NCAP decides to disregard decisions made by automakers to green the energy sources for their plants. At present this is most commonly done for EV manufacturing, automakers perhaps rightly assuming that folks choosing to buy an EV are, at least at this point in time, more inclined to be folks looking at the impacts of their purchases. And so, for example, the Volkswagen EV manufacturing plant in Zwickau, where the ID3, ID4 and Audi Q4 e-tron are made, among others, is arguably carbon neutral. I say arguably because at present it uses natural gas and renewable energy. The natural gas and other emissions are offset through a variety of projects. So I get some skepticism about carbon offsets because, well, carbon offsets. But discounting that entirely, then claiming that the ID3 produces more CO2 in manufacturing than the Golf is disingenuous, if not frankly deliberately misleading. As green NCAP's numbers expand to more models and more automakers, it'll be interesting to see if it decides to fix this in its calculations, along with taking account of the fact that some automakers are moving to design vehicles for a circular economy. As things stand though, it looks like green NCAP would factor those numbers out, since well, they'd help EVs. One place that Green NCAP does, however, trust manufacturers is in the provided fuel consumption figures for each company's fossil fueled vehicles. An interesting decision considering the growing body of evidence, we've dropped a couple of links below, that show that actual consumption can be expected to be about 30 to 40% higher than official estimates suggest. Which is odd. Because I'm sure nobody ever cheats on emissions and fuel economy figures. That would be wrong. But I suppose less surprising as a choice if you want to make EVs look less efficient in comparison. I'm not saying that's what they did, but it's interesting how they've chosen to correct for things on EVs and then not on fossil fuel vehicles. So all of that, along with a few other rather dubious calculations like completely ignoring the greening of the grid and possibly using vastly out of date figures for the carbon output from the grid currently, are rolled into the LCA, the Life Cycle Assessment, which explains why the green NCAP Life Cycle Analysis suggests that EVs aren't as much cleaner as they demonstrably are in so many other studies. Okay, so far so tediously normal. But then we get into the whole exciting world that Green NCAP has created with its primary energy demand metric. Now, I mentioned this earlier and I hope to hell this is the last time I hear of this utterly ridiculous number. Because, well, let's unpeel this onion. What is primary energy demand? Well, it's a calculation, and I use that term incredibly loosely, which attempts to be an assessment of the total amount of energy required by a vehicle over a similar cycle of manufacture, usage and recycling, ignoring how that energy is sourced. Yes, that's right, ignoring how that energy is sourced. So the primary energy demand is basically the energy cost of a vehicle taking no account of how damaging, how toxic and how polluting that energy is. Which is ridiculous. Sure, we can make a pretty good argument that part of the problem that has led to our climate change predicament is that we are using too much energy. We can certainly argue that those of us in financially prosperous countries could or even should use less. But while you can shutter coal plants and turn off the natural gas taps as you transition to renewables, there simply isn't enough land to switch us all to biofuels. Not if we all want to eat, anyway. Oh, and biofuels are incredibly carbon intensive anyway. If we keep building fossil fuel powered vehicles, we'll continue to need fossil fuels to power them. And it's the fossil fuels that really underlie a trajectory towards a planet on which human survival is not a given. But then this report and its hideously skewed and inaccurate representations are probably what you expect to get if you appoint a combustion engine evangelist as your technical director. It's really disappointing to see this from an arm of an otherwise respected organisation. But as fossil fuels continue to be marginalised and their harms are more clearly understood, we're increasingly going to see thinly veiled lobbying wearing a loose science disguise. All we can do is keep an eye out for it and call it out when we see it and keep pushing for a cleaner, greener future. That's it for today. Thank you for watching and we'll be back with more soon. If you liked the video be sure to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to leave your thoughts below or in our free to join Discord chat room. There's a link down there. 
If you haven't already, make sure you're subscribed to this channel and our other channel, Transport Evolve Take 2, and give the bell a gentle ding to make sure you're told when our next video goes live. And of course, check your notification settings. Thanks on behalf of the entire TE crew go out to the folks on my right. They are our $15 to $49 a month supporters. Special thanks to our $50 a month patrons, Chris Maxwell, Bennett Elder, Brian Newton, David Kitchen, Michael Goad, Ricky Leong, Andrew Martin, Guido Drahota, Brophy Wolf, Tessa in the Gong, Gordon C, Stephen O'Donoghue, Carl Hodgson, Anthony Coates, Raging Fellows, Rory Litwin, Jim Burness, Chris Ascenter, and Denny Hyde. And our deepest gratitude to our $100 a month Patreon supporters, Anonymous Freak, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, Joe Bresney, JP Fagerback, Will Graylin, Matthew Drobnak, John Lyons, Christopher Lee Jones, Andrew Glenn, Paul Conway, Laura Reynolds, Ellery Hensley, and, of course, Ian. Feeling left out? You can join Patreon at the link below. You can hit the join button down there to support us on YouTube or show us your support through Bitcoin, Kofi, or our cool swag store. Links down there. If you're not in a position to do that right now, know that liking, sharing, and commenting on our videos really helps support us too and helps us with the, the all-powerful algorithm. Get off. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Thanks. Thanks for joining me. And as always, keep evolving.